I'm sure this is something you've encountered in uh, online conversations about German tanks, uh, this idea that they were over-engineered. Now, more often than not, this term is used as sort of excuse to hand wave away why they were so expensive, unreliable, um, and complicated, and uh, presents this kind of spectrum of, of quality and quantity, where quality is on one side, quantity on the other side, and the more engineering you do, the more your product goes towards the quality end. Um, so it's just, you know, over-engineering is perhaps too much of a good thing. Uh, now, my background is in engineering. I have an engineering degree. And so today I wanted to uh, take off my historian hat for a little bit and put on my engineering hat and talk to you all about uh, tank design, but this time from a little bit of an engineering side. Uh, first, of course, we need a proper definition of what over-engineering is, and lots of sources define it in lots of different ways, uh, but the best one I actually found was on Wikipedia. Over-engineering is often identified with design choices that increase safety, add functionality, or overcome a perceived design flaw that most users would not notice or would accept. It has been employed intentionally in situations where an exceptionally wide margin of error is desired, but is otherwise considered an error of design due to the disproportionate time and resources needed to manufacture and maintain such products, as well as the introduction of unneeded single points of failure. So in other words, uh, over-engineering is making a compromise, um, and all engineering is about making compromises. Uh, making a compromise in favor of some kind of feature or property of the product that, well, it's not really necessary. It should not really have been a part of the requirements. Uh, to put that in a broader spectrum, um, requirement gathering is a fundamental part of the engineering life cycle. Uh, I won't bore you with the exact details because engineering life cycle management is a much, much more important part of engineering than, than math or physics maybe. Um, and I've sat through entire courses um, sometimes slept through in dark courses uh, on the topic. And so in order for at least some of my audience to remain awake, I'm going to simplify it really, really a lot. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the first step is requirements gathering. Uh, we have a lot of solutions out there that are looking for a problem that they solve. Uh, when you're building a tank, this is probably best done the other way around. First, you say uh, a high-level qualitative requirement. So, for example, I would like a uh, heavily armored assault tank that can assault enemy fortifications. And then you translate those requirements into qualitative requirements, so numerical requirements. Uh, with the assault tank, for example, you would say that you would like a tank that has enough armor to withstand a hit from contemporary anti-tank guns. Um, and that can mean different things in different periods. For example, uh, Soviet heavy tanks from the early 30s had 30 millimeters of front armor, which was laughable by the 1940s. But at the time, they were designed to go up against the gold standard at the time, which was the British three-pounder. And British three-pounder shot could penetrate at most about 30 millimeters of armor. So therefore, for the time, this requirement was quite sufficient. Uh, for armament, same thing. You very rarely do you say, I want a tank with the biggest and best and like, coolest, latest gun. Uh, usually you say, I want a tank that has a gun that can complete a specific mission. Uh, for example, a tank destroyer would have very high velocity, relatively small caliber gun. Uh, and then these, this hypothetical assault tank would have a lower velocity gun that fires a very powerful high explosive or concrete piercing shell. So once the requirements are identified, uh, then you go to the prototype stage. Uh, prototype is designed, built, and tested. Usually some corrections are identified because it's very unlikely you get it right in the first try. And then once the uh, corrections have been made to the design, then you're ready for manufacturing. Uh, now, of course, requirements evolve, the battlefield evolves, and these higher level qualitative requirements uh, can lead to revised quantitative requirements, for example. During manufacturing, the tank can be equipped with a bigger gun or more armor. Uh, but of course, some limitations of the original design still exist. And with time, we get to obsolescence. Uh, this tank no longer satisfies the initial requirements. So therefore, it is removed from production and then from service and development of a replacement begins. Uh, with that, I can take off my engineering hat and we can talk about what this looks like in the context of tank design. 
Now let's apply what we learned about the engineering life cycle to uh, an example that the British School of Tank Technology called an engineering achievement of the first magnitude, the T-34 tank. The T-34 tank was designed according to requirements set after the Spanish Civil War. Uh, these were, it has to be fast, it has to be well protected um, against contemporary man portable and uh, small cruiser of anti-tank weapons that were becoming quite popular and quite lethal there around that time. Uh, and it had to have a powerful enough gun to fight both enemy tanks and light field fortifications such as earthworks. Um, the A-20 and the A-32 tanks were developed to meet those requirements and then the A-32 evolved into the A-34 which was accepted into service as the T-34. Now, uh, one of the major differences between the A-32 and the A-34 was armor. Uh, the A-32's 500 horsepower V2 engine was actually too powerful for what the Red Army needed it to do, which is a form of over-engineering. Um, and the extra margin created by this extra powerful engine was used to add more armor to the tank. So it uh, became protected not just from high caliber machine guns, but also from 37 and 45 millimeter anti-tank guns. To quote the British again, uh, this design shows a clear headed appreciation of the essentials of an effective tank and the requirements of war. Now, of course, the British reviewed a fairly early version of the T-34 uh, and the tank after the one that they reviewed got a number of upgrades. Those included both upgrades to the firepower, the 85 millimeter gun, and various upgrades to the tank's protection, which I talk about in a different video. Uh, both of these, of course, made use of the extra margin of safety that was introduced in with the V2 engine. Um, and even though the T-34's weight went from 26 to 32 tons over the course of the Second World War, no substantial change to the design had to be made because it was over-engineered. As you can see, over-engineering is not really an impediment to making a tank in large numbers or making a high-quality, reliable tank. The American Sherman tank is also a pretty good example of how to rationally identify your requirements and build a design that matches them. Uh, it was largely made with components, tried and true automotive components uh, from the Median Tank M3 uh, or even earlier predecessors. Uh, and it did inherit some weaknesses of the design, uh, like the tall profile, the narrow tracks, the HVSS or VVSS suspension that limited its uh, overall weight. Um, and you might think that, well, the Sherman had all these drawbacks. Uh, they didn't really impact that badly its usefulness in the battlefield. Uh, could the Americans have built a better tank? Of course they could, and of course they did. Um, the T-23 E3, for example, was a, a, a much better tank by every measure than the Sherman, except for when it comes to actually mass producing it and bringing it to the battlefield. Uh, the Sherman, as you've probably heard many times, was good enough, and that's really what engineering is about. It's striking balances until you get something that is good enough in every category. Uh, as one of my former managers told me, it's better to have a product everyone hates than an idea everyone loves. In this case, despite the flack that the Sherman caught, the T23 E3 being the idea that everyone loves, just was not really practical for the Americans to switch production to. Now, despite being this kind of uh, level-headed balance of brand new solutions and tried and true parts, the Sherman still was built with tons and tons of room for expansion. For example, uh, the 75 millimeter gun was serviced inside a 69 inch turret ring, which was absolutely ridiculous compared to say, the Churchill tank, which had the same caliber of gun serviced in just a 55 inch turret ring. So really the Americans could have made their tank much smaller if they had shrunk the turret ring to match the gun. Um, in general, the with all the upgrades to firepower and armor, uh, the Sherman grew in weight from 30 tons to 34 tons, and if you count the jumbo, to 38 tons. So really, the engine was too powerful uh, for the Sherman tank that was built initially. Uh, the suspension carried was, was capable of carrying too much weight right all of these could be shrunk down thinned down filed down in order to build a tank that was cheaper but they weren't uh, so in a way the sherman tank was also over engineered to create the safety margin and then the margin later on was used up as the tank was modernized to meet the needs of an evolving battlefield 
as you can see, the design of both the Sherman and the T-34 falls under the criteria of over-engineering. However, over-engineering in this case really didn't stop the Americans and the Soviets from building a tank cost-effectively and building tons of them. So as you can see, over-engineering, based on this formal definition, is not inherently bad. But let's return to the Germans, uh, specifically the Tiger tank is a good example. The Tiger tank started pretty rationally with the identification of a need for an assault tank. Uh, this assault tank needed a short 75mm gun to fire a high explosive shell and about 50mm of front armor for reasonable resistance to contemporary anti-tank weapons. So far so good. Uh, now these needs changed between 1938 and 1941 and by 1941 the new German assault tank had to have an 88mm gun which required a new larger turret, and 100 millimeters of front armor, which of course required greater weight. And so while the initial assault tank was in the 30 ton weight class, this new tank, the VK4501, as the name implies, was in the 45 ton class. Uh, now the final product, the Tiger tank, weighed 57 tons rather than the 45. Uh, so how could this happen? Um, how could the Germans brazenly ignore this requirement? Well, unfortunately, when you take an existing design and just scale it up to fit more armor or a larger gun, individual components get heavier. And as components get heavier, they need components that can support the weight. Traditionally, the easiest way of doing that is by either thickening the supports or adding reinforcing ribs, which in turn adds more weight. And so the components holding those components have to get heavier. Uh, the floor plate has to now have bracing to prevent it from buckling. Uh, the tank has to be balanced, which usually in German practice meant adding a counterweight. Uh, now that your hull and turret are much heavier, the engine has to be scaled up. A bigger engine weighs more and also needs a bulkier cooling system, which weighs more. And all of this snowballs together to create a much larger vehicle than a much heavier vehicle than originally envisioned. Uh, now, is this unique to the Germans? No, but in especially Soviet practice, uh, weight was considered very, very important. And there's actually an inquiry in Factory 183 when the T-34 production tanks weighed only one ton more than the prototypes. Uh, the Red Army had quite a bit of leverage when it came to Soviet production. And so these increases were handled very, very seriously in the Soviet government. As British analysis of captured Tiger tanks shows, well, that might not have been the case of the Nazis. The tank bristles with every sort of complication, and one would think that it would be at least twice as difficult to produce as either of its predecessors. This may have a bearing on the number that are likely to be met with in the future and the degree of dilution by Mark 3s and 4s. It is extremely instructive to note the manner in which the Germans will face the problem of designing and producing a highly complicated mechanism in order to get functional perfection, rather than accept something less effective, which the manufacturer would find easier or more desirable to produce. The relationship between state and industry in the Reich is evidently on a highly satisfactory footing. So the difference between the USSR and Germany was that Germany was fighting a war for profit. Uh, and this profit was to be had by these very powerful corporations, because of course, where there's lots of money, there's lots of power. Um, and the relationship between German industry and the German army was actually the reverse. It was the industry that had lots of influence on the kind of product that the army would consume and not the other way around. And so while the Soviets were arguing about every ton, German engineering companies and the subcontractors uh, had that kind of swing in the German government to justify increasing the weights, increasing the cost, and ultimately, well, as you can see, the weight of the Tiger tank grew by more than a quarter. In fact, the degree to which German manufacturers used German tanks to enrich themselves shocked the British, as evidenced by another report. In some respects, the Germans seem to have been victimized by their suppliers. For instance, Ball bearing manufacturers making turret ring races sound like a very extravagant proposition. The lavish use of ball and roller bearings throughout German AFV designs suggest the workings of a cartel. But let's go back to the previous British comment about functional perfection. Did the Tiger achieve functional perfection? Uh, maybe it 
was built without any kind of margin for error or improvement because it was perfect. Well, not really. In Already in 1942, Hitler required the Tiger tank to be built with a longer, more powerful 88mm gun, the uh, Kampfwagen Kanon 43. Uh, now, of course, as you probably know, this was not possible to fit in the Tiger's existing turret. The new turret had to be built, which combined with a number of other changes and requirements, resulted in a completely different tank, the Tiger Alsf B or Tiger II, which was only fielded in 1944. Unlike the T-34 or the Sherman tank, the Tiger was built without any reserves, without any margins. It was not over-engineered. It was built precisely to work at the weight, the functionality that it was designed with. Uh, and when it came time to increase its firepower or its armor, nothing could be done. Uh, the changes to the Tiger tank throughout the course of its production really weren't major, uh, and it was impossible to make significant upgrades without shifting to a whole new chassis. When it comes to the iteration stage of the engineering design cycle, the Tiger was quite a colossal failure. But remember the other aspect of over-engineering, adding functionality. Uh, you can add functionality, it's still over-engineering if it was something that was not really desirable or could be dealt without. Um, the uh, Tiger's uh, snorkel system, of course, comes, um, comes up in that discussion, but that's not really the core thing that Tiger had to contribute to the battlefield. Uh, that would be its, its armor and its firepower. So maybe there was no way to build a heavy tank with 100 millimeters of armor and an 88 millimeter gun other than making it a 57 ton monster. Well, as future developments showed, that's not entirely the case. Uh, the Pershing tank weighed just about 42 tons. Uh, it had comparable armor to the Tiger and a comparable gun. And the IS-2 tank at uh, 45 tons had a more powerful gun and thicker armor. So really, the 57 ton weight of the Tiger tank doesn't have any kind of feature that would justify it. It was just tremendously overweight for what it offered. So as you can see by the formal definition, uh, the term over-engineering doesn't really apply to tanks like the Tiger. Uh, it didn't really have any kind of built-in margins or any kind of extra features uh, that justified its incredible weight, complexity, and cost. Uh, really, when you think about it, the Tiger wasn't over-engineered. It was just engineered badly.